Thank you very much for asking me to come to speak to you. I know that you had a great dinner last night. So I think it's really good that this number of people have managed to get up this morning after that uh, dinner, which looked like it was fun. What am I going to run through? Well, I just want to remind you all that we're all born to die. I know it sounds obvious, but people tend to forget it. Um, you can plan for what you want or what you don't want to happen, but actually for clinicians, the most important skill is to listen. And I'm going to say a little bit about families, especially children in families, uh, and you don't protect them by excluding them from information. And uh, also why stopping treatment is not euthanasia. And then just touch on living with uncertainty, because it can be the hardest thing of all with illness, and we seek for certainty in medicine. But I think it's important to remember that for the patients, uncertainty in a world where we're making out that everyone can control everything and we're becoming control freaks in a way, uh, it is actually really important. And a phrase that I often use with patients is, look, I think we need to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And that's a kind of framework that can be quite useful. Thank goodness we have an NHS. It's worth just remembering what it's like in other parts of the world where there isn't an NHS, where illness actually is absolutely devastating, crippling, and can bankrupt families. Um, but dying in the NHS, well, are we ready for it or not? And I think that we're not. And I've got a private member's bill, which comes up on Friday the 14th, uh, which is about access to palliative care, because it's very patchy. We know that. Uh, it's not adequately commissioned at the moment. So just to wake you all up after last night, I hope that you can all recite the five principles of the Mental Capacity Act. So everyone, put your left hand in the air. Right, good. Okay, the five principles. You, I hope you all know this, but it's a bit of revision. Your little finger, you presume someone has capacity. And we keep on seeing people with end-stage disease who have fluctuating capacity, so it can be quite difficult to assess. But the second one that's really important, individuals should be supported to make their own decision. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Those of you that have got a wedding ring on that finger, well, look at the middle finger. It might have been an unwise decision. I leave you <laughs> discuss it over coffee, not now, OK? But actually, if you go to the pincer movement in your hand, okay, that's where the strength is in your hand. That's the strongest movement. That's where the power is in your hand if you have to take best interest decisions on behalf of patients. And the bit that doesn't happen very well is about individuals being supported to make their own decision. <coughs> Excuse me. And the reason is, I think, that we're a bit obsessed with patient leaflets, patient information leaflets, etc. Well, if you have difficulty reading or cognitive difficulties, leaflets are probably the worst thing that you could have as a source of information. Um, and so, if you're going to support somebody, you need to think, what's the information they need? What are the real options? Don't give them a whole load of options that are unrealistic. And use that person's strengths. Try to frame the information in the context of something they understand. So, if you've got a patient who's been a car mechanic, then you might use the analogy of an engine. If you've got somebody who's perhaps been sitting at a desk all the time, you might use it in terms of a biro when it's running out of ink. Uh, just simple things that people can frame around. And only when you have made every effort to support that person and it hasn't worked and you've asked yourself, why didn't your support work? Only then do you go down the route of saying, well, I think they probably don't have capacity for that decision. All too often I see people leap in and think, oh, we'll assess capacity. They don't have capacity and shortcut, and actually, they haven't gone through this really important step. And it is in legislation. So what do people need to make a decision, any decision? 
Well, they need accurate information relevant to them. Oops. They need to have capacity, obviously, to make that decision at that time. It's decision and time specific, and it must be voluntary. This is not about getting people to make the decision you want them to make. This is about supporting them to make their own decision. It is not the decision that's most convenient for the unit or whatever. Now, what about when people, though, are nearing the end of life? Well, Cicely Saunders said, you matter because you are you, and you matter to the last moment of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. Very, very important. This is about living. This isn't about waiting to die. Obviously, it's better to prevent suffering than alleviate it. That was Nye Bevan, that quote, from the book, In Place of Fear. And you need to intervene early. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm full of cold. Um, you need to intervene and think palliatively early on. This isn't about the blue box at the end, the dying bit. If that's when you think about palliative care, you're too late. You've missed your opportunity, you've missed the boat, basically. Um, you need to think about the interventions to improve quality of life really early on in the, in the pink and the grey boxes. And people may have pain, they may have distress, they may have other symptoms such as nausea and so on. They are all made worse by social, emotional and spiritual distress. So I've seen many patients where they've said they've got terrible pain, and actually when you unravel those other domains around, their physical cause for their pain is there, but their pain experience improves. Having said that, I have never, and it's not often you can say never in medicine, seen somebody who's complained of pain who doesn't have a physical cause for their pain but they may well have disturbance, upset, lots of things that they're carrying that make that pain experience worse. In the developed world, where we have the science and know what to do, we may not be doing it, but we do know what to do. For most people, dying isn't the sudden presence of death. It's not the grim reaper appearing at the end of the bed, but it's the gentle slipping away an absence of life. So what happens when a person dies? People want to know what's going to happen to them. And you can just talk about it openly with them. What are they frightened will happen? And explain to them that yes, they will be weaker and frailer and they will slip into a coma and that is not going to sleep. Please nobody talk to relatives, particularly not children, about they've gone to sleep, because that poor kid will be frightened of going to sleep and frightened when other relatives in the family go to sleep. <coughs> Their breathing slows and eventually it stops. There's nothing sudden. They just slip away gently. And people really need to know that because they're scared they'll lose their mind. They're scared they'll get really breathless and suddenly be unable to breathe and, oh, sorry, and feel as if they're suffocating. So you need to spell it out. And even if they've got a chest full of fluid on one side, you can listen to their chest with that good old tool called the stethoscope, which kind of has magic properties, doesn't it, for patients. Always examine patients, it's so reassuring. And listen, you can say, look, you've got air going in on that side. It isn't going on well there. The signals are going up to your brain from this side, breathe harder which is why you feel breathless, but you will carry on having air going in and out on this side. There's no reason not. And they're hugely relieved. But if you don't have that conversation, those fears just build up. What about recognizing, though, when death is imminent? Well, there was an interesting study that came from uh, the area of England called the Northern Powerhouse. I'm not going to be any more specific than that. Um, 
and it showed that in the cancer centre, actually, 100% of the time, they were okay at recognising death was imminent. But actually, with cancer, it's really easy. Uh, but only two-thirds in the general hospital. The problem is that for the other third, there was no warning, the family didn't know. Sometimes they were carrying on with completely inappropriate interventions. I mean, what is the point of someone being on statins when they're frail and going to die? It's, it's rubbish. Put them on a drug diet. They're much better off with a little glass of wine, a beer, a bit of whiskey or something, and cut out half their medication, and they'll feel much better. Just try to think, do they really need this? And if you're not sure, try taking it out. Sometimes they feel a lot better. Um, my colleagues in Wales have come up with a few ways to try to think about advanced care planning and move forwards. And I think the traffic lights is quite useful. Because if you think that someone's got months, probably, and who knows, toss a coin on it, it's a guess, isn't it? You can't predict prognosis, but you can kind of have a feel. Well, if it's months, go for advanced care planning. Think about what do they want, what don't they want. Make sure they get their DS 1500 because they're eligible for it. And make sure that the GP puts them on a palliative care register because the evidence is they'll get better care in primary care too. If you're getting down to weeks, and they're really frail, make sure you've got an emergency plan, make sure you've got just-in-case boxes done. So in the house, at the weekend, they've got what they're likely to need in the event of a crisis. It's awful if a family has to go driving around trying to find a chemist that's open. And I was always haunted, actually, by one young man whose father suddenly developed severe pain the out of hours came out, gave him a prescription. He drove from Merthyr Tydfil to Cardiff to find a chemist that was open. So that's about an, an hour and a half round trip. By the time he got home, his dad was dead. He'd missed it. And it's just awful. Whereas actually, if he'd had a just-in-case box there, they could have used what they've got there. And if you're down to days, well, then update the care plan Think about DNA CPR. I'm going to give you a couple of resources that may help for that. And make sure that the family are aware, particularly children in the family, children, grandchildren, that they know that actually the end of life is coming, that it's imminent. You don't protect kids at all by not talking openly. Children need to know it's okay, you can go to school. Mum or grandma will be there when you come home but she's not well, and she probably won't be with us by Christmas. Otherwise, the kids get worried about going to school, or they come home and find the person's dead. <coughs> Communication can be difficult. And my colleague and I, um, Nikki Pease, and I uh, try to analyze different consultations, and we really came up with a six-point toolkit, which is like rolling a dice rolling the die. And the first thing, of course, is comfort. Make sure that you're in a comfortable situation if you're going to have a difficult situation. If you need to go to the loo, go to the loo before you have the conversation. Because if you're uncomfortable, the patient will pick up that you're uncomfortable. They won't know why, and they think, they'll think you're uncomfortable because of them, not because you've got a full bladder. Remember the language that you use, keep it simple. What do words mean to patients? And use their language, don't use your language. Because actually medical language is a whole different language altogether. But the most important thing is to listen. And then you can use questions, open questions and focus down. Reflect back, if you're breaking bad news to somebody, Use the patient's words and just reflect back so you haven't felt so well. So you've been worried that what we've been doing hasn't been working. You gradually, gently take them down the road of realisation that you're in the same place. And please summarise at the end. We've, at, we've both spoken about this, and these are the three main things that we've dealt with. 
and summarise so you check out. It's really simple. And summarising is a, is a brilliant tool because if you've got the person in the room who wants to tell you all about when the bus came around the corner and there was a lady on the bus and there was a dog on the bus and they didn't have the right money, you think, whoa, how do I stop this? You can just do the traffic lights. You know. Just a moment, can I just summarise? The journey in was difficult. Now let's talk about da da da. Okay? Because otherwise you're sitting there waiting for them to get to the point. Summarising can be really useful. This is the Chinese symbol for listening. And I think it's absolutely spot on. Because you listen not just with your ears. In fact, you can be completely deaf and you still listen. You listen with who you are. You listen with your eyes to all those nonverbal cues that are really powerful. The person who looks down when they're talking about something, that's the thing that they're really worried about. You listen with undivided attention. And above all, you listen from the heart. And you all know if you're talking to somebody and they're not listening from the heart. Remember, if you listen with who you are, with your undivided attention, and from the heart, you will be much more efficient in time than if you don't. You'll get there very much more quickly, and the person in front of you will feel as if they've had a huge amount of your time. CPR is a difficult thing. Please don't talk about resuscitation. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about cardiopulmonary resuscitation. My colleague, Mark Talbot, and this is a resource. Uh, you just go, if you just Google talk CPR, you'll get it. We got an award last week at the College of Physicians for all of the resources that we've got up there. Those of you who speak Welsh, it's also bilingual, but I would expect most of you to access the English resource. But we actually also put together a very short introductory clip, and now every GP in Wales and all the hospital, hospitals have got a resource pack of all the videos, like a little video book that they can lend to patients. So I'll take you through the quick advert now. When families are faced with severe incurable illness, having information is everything. Who will speak for you if you're no longer well enough to speak for yourself? Which medical treatments would you want? <coughs> and which would you refuse? It all starts with an honest conversation with your healthcare team and family. One of these important discussions is about cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. And why would anyone want to discuss a do not attempt CPR decision? In Wales, we have a policy called sharing and involving that aims to help honest and frank communication about this sensitive and personal subject. Don't wait to be asked. If you have a life-limiting palliative illness, discuss your views on CPR with your doctor or nurse. Talk CPR. Okay, that's the resource. We produced that as an advert for television to try to get the conversations going uh, and open them up. And of course, I'm quite proud of the fact that we've been ahead of England because we've had um, the changes in transplant legislation for some time as well, and all of this fits together with it. Uh, but people do need warning. They need to plan. They need to be able to make a memory box. They need to be able to put things together and know that they've done that, they've completed their life's work, that they have time. I'm back to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Have they made a will? Have they got their finances in order? Are there things that they feel that they want to do that they haven't yet done? Excuse me, I'm going to do the awful thing on the stage, which is blow my nose in public. So bear with me. But, uh, that's the glory of having family come home at the weekend with colds. Very kind of them. There we are. Sorry. Um, so they can put things together. For children, they often actually want a pullover or an old piece of clothing of the person. 
because it smells of them, it feels the touch of them, and so on, and it can be really comforting. But they need to know what it is, they need to have a choice. What it is that they want to have, what are the mementos? The special photographs that go in the memory box, let family discuss them first. So what are we trying to do with our palliative care all the time? Well, we're trying to improve the quality of life in whatever time is left. So we're trying to improve reality, help people function and feel as well as they can with the situation, but also be quite open and honest and help them reset their hopes and aspirations. If somebody's going to be coming over in three months' time from Australia or New Zealand, well, perhaps have the conversation. Would it help if they came a bit earlier? If there's a family event, why not celebrate earlier? And actually, if things are fine, you can celebrate again later. But enjoy it. Have the fun of doing things together. Don't put it off and hope that things will be all right. Another resource for you, this is from, again, uh, from, from what we've got in Wales. Um, if you go on to Wales Palliative Care Information, you'll find that we've got these resources. I've, sorry, I've lost the box, actually, uh, on here. But there is the adult and network guidelines are available. You can click on there. They've been uh, developed across the UK and they've got symptom and drug dose guidelines and everything, and you can just click on that. It's all open access for symptom control for whatever uh, condition that you're, you're facing. What about stopping treatment? There, we, we now live in a, in a world where there is a view that doctors are overzealously treating patients. I don't think they are. I think some patients sometimes don't get the treatment actually that they need. We are too anti-high tech. Sometimes a little bit of high tech intervention can sort things out really well. But nobody can be treated against their will. If they don't want to be treated with one thing or another, that's fine. But it must be an informed decision. And of course what we do is weigh up the risks and the burdens against the benefits and do that with the patient not ahead of time, unless, of course, it's going to be futile to even discuss it with the patient because it's not an option. But when we stop treatment, whatever that treatment is, and of course, for all of you, dialysis is the kind of barn door one, um, people will die. Yes, they'll die of their underlying disease. You have not killed them. They had died of something that they would have died of much earlier if they hadn't had that intervention. This is what you could say, nature takes its course. You are not killing the patient. The disease is killing the patient. And that is fundamentally different to euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide where you're going to give a drug with the express intention to kill somebody. So it's usually nine to 10 grams of a barbiturate or similar. Uh, if it's euthanasia, you may follow that up with curare, so they're totally paralyzed. Then they die of asphyxia. And they would have lived for who knows how long. There's a case in the Times this morning of a 17-year-old girl in the Netherlands with anorexia um, who just had euthanasia, well, I think her life expectancy would have been decades going on. Uh, I have a real problem with it because she had been sexually abused and had anorexia, and I really worry about killing the victim and leaving the perpetrators go free. But that's a, a separate political debate, really. Cicely Saunders said, dignity is having a sense of personal worth. I get worried by the press who say things like, oh, it must be awful to be incontinent. It must be terrible to be unable to walk. Well, actually, Tani Gray Thompson has a pretty good life in a wheelchair, and she's won a lot of gold medals from her wheelchair. And if you talk to people over 60, most of them leak a bit. They just don't go around talking about it. 
That's why these panty pads manufacturers make so much money. Good place to put shares, I think, uh, as the population gets older. It isn't at all about your bodily functions. And if you have a colostomy and it bursts, you'd hope everybody would just be kind and sympathetic and not view you any worse. They'd help you get to the bathroom and to get cleaned up, and that would be it. So it's about knowing that you are of value, that you are of worth. I had a situation when I was in the Netherlands of a woman who was talking about euthanasia and she was very breathless and I said to the GP, does she have an inhaler? Because she might be able to talk better. She said, I don't want an inhaler. Everyone in Holland speaks English well. I don't want an inhaler. Um, my grandson has one and he hates it. So I turned to her and said, well, perhaps if you had the same one as him, and you, he taught you how to use it, you never know, that might save his life. Because if he's got bad asthma, he needs to have his inhaler on him so that if he gets an asthma attack, he can use it. And her comment was, oh, so I can still be of some use. At that point, the conversation about euthanasia vanished and she took a prescription for an inhaler to match the same one that her grandson had. Our living and our dying have an effect on those around. And it's really important that we do everything we can. I think you can see here, it's a beautiful picture. The love in the eyes of both. So what about children? Well, the way a person dies lives on in the memory of those left behind. Children need to know, they need explanations, they need to understand, and they need honest, clear explanations of what's happening. On average, 10% of school children have been seriously bereaved. A third have lost a parent or sibling, so that's on average one child in every class and there will be two others who've lost someone else close to them. And yet, as a society, we completely close our eyes to it. And these kids, if they don't have support pre-bereavement, through bereavement, and afterwards, do much worse in life. They do worse academically, they're at risk of depression, and so on, and so on. So bereavement care, and that includes pre-bereavement care, is the most effective form of preventive medicine in our society. There are lots of resources that you can use, that you can access, the Child Bereavement Trust. There are lots of things. The one that I think is really useful is you just don't understand, because teenagers have a real difficulty in expressing their emotions. So if you're sitting with a teenager explaining that their parent is dying, They'll probably look at the floor, they'll kick on the floor, they'll kick a Coke can around, and the most that they'll say is, ugh. But actually, you need to just keep that relationship going. And a really important clue is to ask them what music they're listening to. Because if it's black and awful, that's what their mood is like. That's how they feel. But they do need support, and just because they reject everything, Please don't accept that rejection. Just be there. Let them understand what's happening. And for those children uh, who've got learning difficulties, who can't read, there are resources, the books Beyond Words, that are a fantastic resource, and you can use those and talk through what's happening and how things are going. So again, another resource for you, just for your teens. The books Beyond Words, they're, they're not very expensive. There's a website where you can get them all. But I think the most important thing for us all to remember is that we're living with uncertainty. And we have to acknowledge that uncertainty. And we have to be honest enough in medicine. Well, and I'm saying medicine in the broadest sense, medicine, nursing, everything, to say, we just don't know. Sometimes it's the hardest thing to say. I'm sorry, I just don't know. 
And quite often I'll say, I wish I could tell you, but I just don't know. And if you're not certain what's going on, be honest with people and say, I just don't know, but this is what we're going to do to try to unscramble what's happening. Because uncertainty is really hard to live with. Thank you.